a lot of you guys here in the room helped out. So thank you for that. And a lot of you were able to come out and attend dinner afterwards, even though you may not have played golf. So thanks for coming and doing that. It's a fun time. Um, we were able to raise more money than we have in the past couple of years. I think we're sitting right at about $6,500 for that tournament. So that's great. That's good news for our uh, scholarships that we fund for that tournament. So thanks for everyone for showing up, supporting, and helping out. Um, one other Sweet. thing, too, to kind of uh, let you guys know, most everyone here is familiar with the bike ride. We used bike ride we started three years ago. Highway to Hell. Um, good news is... Several of us have been working this fall. We've been admitted to a, a series of races. It's kind of like a state sanctioned event. Kind of a big deal. It helps attract more riders and will raise more money for us. And we're excited about that. And the committee that uh, helps put that ride on, you guys will be getting an email or two in the next, I would say, month or so asking for help. Because in order for us to pull this off, and I work for it to be a big, successful, uh, a, a great ride, as well as a great fundraiser for our organization and our scholarship. We want to get a little more help than what we had last year. So, those are one of the few things I had this year. And there are a wide variety of volunteer opportunities. Yes. There's a bike race. You don't have to know anything about bikes. No. Or, sorry, it's a ride. Okay. So, um, we have doing the introduction. So Chris said last week that, hey, we had to get two good speakers. You're going to have to raise the bar. So I've disappointed them right off the bat. I'm disappointed right off the bat there. So, um, um, so what our talk is today is about thinking about digital marketing. Now, um, just to set expectations, this is not a kind of how-to skills, all that kind of stuff, what's cool thing. This is more about kind of the philosophy and me being a little bit of a curmudgeonly old man, uh, much as I hate the we, we had a thing, a discussion in class last night, and we were talking about audiences, and, and the, the kids were uh, segmenting the students out, and they said 55 plus, and said those are really old people. I said, whoa, wait a second, I'm 55. And so 
That didn't seem to change their opinion at all. But um, we'll talk about digital marketing, mostly about our role as stewards. I, I, if you had the summer thing up, this is about our stewardship, our, our obligations as stewards for our clients' money. And so, and I'm moving around, Kelly. Are you trying You're to fine. You're good. Um, a quick prelude. The one, the one quote that everybody knows about advertising is probably the worst thing that's happened to us, right? A clients go to client school to learn this quote, right? Half of my money spent in advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know what half. You know, that's the only quote anybody knows about advertising, right? And it's the thing that really gets to what our problem is as an industry. Um, you know, if I had to define what waste is, it's about waste. And waste is advertising or PR that doesn't pay for itself in some way. doesn't pay for itself. And as an industry, we've done a pretty poor job of trying to communicate that we deliver on what the way our clients are spending money on. So, for instance, we've had mixed messages about that. And into this world that we've been living in all those years, digital came along. And digital's promise to everyone was, we can save you that half. You boil it down. We can save you that half. You're not going to waste it because if you use digital, you're not going to waste your money. Right? That's the thing. And so it became, it evolved into this idea of traditional versus digital. Traditional versus digital. And we probably all kind of understand what that framing is about that. And just to give you some context, there are 12 million, roughly 12 million web pages on the internet. <coughs> They have the phrase good versus evil. Fundamental battle between good versus evil. 12 million web pages, right? There are 172 million pages on the internet that say digital versus traditional. Okay? That's what people are talking about. It's, 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 it's ramped up even more, right? This discussion about traditional versus digital. And in this discussion, it's devolved into this little thing where the young people get it and the old people don't. Right? That it, it's, kind of, it's kind of more personal then a lot of discussions that we have about media, that digital is this thing that there's been a lot of resistance to, and it's because of more of an age thing than, than, a, than a value thing. And as a matter of fact, you know, you look at certain uh, articles when people talk about it, this headline here says, <coughs> last uh, January, digital advertising forecast, brands cut back, agencies double down in terms of digital advertising. And the idea is the headline sounds crazy. The idea that someone would even consider cutting their digital budget. That it sounds almost crazy. That's, that's kind of where the irrational exuberance that we've had about digital in a way. So what I would say is, is ways that we've lost our way a little bit as an industry. Um, we have um, we've become cheerleaders for a medium. And this is actually Jeff Davis High School in Montgomery, Alabama. I don't know if I found that, but they're cheerleaders for hamburgers. Um, we have become cheerleaders for media in a way that abrogates our responsibility to be stewards of our clients' money, the stewards of the money that we entrusted with. So it's become this idea of traditional versus digital, this idea that you're wasting money versus making money, and the idea of this change from the idea that we as practitioners have a toolbox of things to use, that we have a silver bullet that we can use, that has changed that way. Digital is not a synonym for effective, but if you read a lot of what people talk about, they use it as a synonym. They also use synonym, digital as a synonym for magic. Because how does it happen? What's magic? Who knows how it happens, right? It happens. And so, again, I am not anti-digital in any way. I don't look, I'm trying to be a skeptic. Part of my job as a media planner, which is probably of all the things that Nietzsche said, media is really what I'm most centered on, is that our job is to be skeptical. You know, did you really deliver what you're supposed to? Should it cost that much? Is it worth that much? All those kinds of skeptical questions that over the years have not gotten asked fairly for other media. When, when I was at Lucky, we bought the very first ad that Time Online ran. We bought it for Bell South. And it was, uh, took us months to actually get it done. But we bought the very first ad. I've got, a, I've got a Yahoo address that doesn't have a number in it. <laughs> so that's how long ago I had a Yahoo address, right? And on Amazon Prime, I looked and I've been buying on Amazon Prime since 1999. And I sold the first thing on eBay like in 90 five or something like that, right? So I'm not I'm not anti digital. I what I'm anti I am anti exuberance when it's uh, when it comes to our stewardship of what we should do. And so the point of this first part is is that there's no good or bad media, right? You know, any media can provide value in the right circumstance. And I just want to make sure that as we go forth, and my word to you today would be is is that you go forth and make those decisions that you give it the same respect that you give other decisions for digital. So just to give some perspective one of the things that kind of gets lost a little bit is 
some perspective about what digital can do in terms of reach. So how does traditional and digital play out uh, for people who really are online and should really be true believers? These 15 brands spent $2.5 billion in advertising in 2015. Facebook, LinkedIn, Netflix, all those. What do you think, what do you think they spent in traditional media? How much do you think you spent in traditional media? Those guys. Out of 100%. Half, maybe? 75%. 75%. The 15, 15 biggest online brands, 75% of their ad spend went to traditional media. I use that a little bit is that I think they, more than anybody, understand what the value that traditional media they I think they have a clear-eyed idea about what they have and uh, what their benefits are. I think they're all cheerleaders for the medias that they're in, but they understand that there are other tools that way traditional brands can pay. You know, this idea about how, how big is online video traffic, another way to provide some context. You know, we hear these numbers, 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. I don't know if you saw the news this week, but this video was on Bin Laden's computer. Did y'all see that? No, they, 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 they went through Bin Laden's computer, and he had Charlie bit my finger on his computer. So I guess when you're holed up in, in Pakistan, there's not much to look at, right? Not in my signal. Um, Four billion views a day, almost five billion views a day on YouTube, right? And so those numbers get talked about in terms of scale of what digital can do for you. On the other hand, if you look at individual, how many views does the average YouTube video get? The average YouTube video, how to and style videos get about 8,300 views. Entertainment, 9,800. Uh, education, 4,800. Autos, travel. I mean, it's all less than 10,000. The average YouTube video gets about 10,000, less than 10,000 views. Uh, I did not look that up. I have to look that up. It's, 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 I only, even, I, I skipped a couple of outliers, like 12, 15,000. Tuscaloosa government really was, took the average of it. The spoof <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the spoof yeah, but, yeah, but. Um, And just to give you an idea of what the max could be, the other end, last, um, um, you know, putting your ads on YouTube, if you have a Super Bowl ad, is one of the things you do to get some additional value. So these are some of the, the ads that were on YouTube last February before the, there. And so the uh, Hyundai's the Chase, uh, the Puppy Monkey Baby one, which I think we all love that, right? Mm -hmm. 22 million views. Um, First date, Bud Light party, 13 million goes on down. Um, and so, you know, the average Super Bowl spot got 111 million views. You know, you're running a traditional 30 second spot on the Super Bowl. And so, you know, even the best way you could probably perceive that would be is, is that, you know, the free advertising that you're getting by putting your spot on online. I mean, the only reason they got 26 million views is because they did put it in the Super Bowl and made it a Super Bowl spot, so people were interested in watching it, right? But the idea is, is that still traditional media provides the kind of reach that, that, that even the best opportunities in YouTube and other digital things don't provide. Don't provide. Now, it's nice. I mean, another way to perceive this is that Hyundai got an additional million dollars in value for the views they had for their spot. That's a good thing. I'm all for that, <coughs> right? But there's nothing that it says, I cannot be on the Super Bowl, and then I can go into YouTube, and I can substitute that audience. Because it's just not the same scale. You remember this? The dunk in the dark spot, mm -hmm. right? Now this was this this was in 2014, I think. You know, the idea when the Super Bowl was in New Orleans, the lights went out, you know, the power went out for a while and people were tweeting. And they did a little um, uh, Oreo did a little um, tweet that said you could, well you can still dunk in the dark. And our industry went gaga over it. Man, this is they won the Super Bowl. You know, you know, talk about all the spots. They won the Super Bowl. So, being the skeptic kind of guy I am, right? I said, well, well, what did winning the Super Bowl with that tweet mean? They got 15,000 retweets and 6,000 likes. They added 8,000 Twitter followers and 20,000 like, got like 20,000 times on Facebook. Big numbers, right? But the ad that Oreo ran in the Super Bowl got 108 million viewers. And Oreo's business, 75 million people eat Oreos every week. So in terms of scale, how did that help my business? It was free. I got a lot of PR for it, right? But in terms of scale, what did that actually do? And, you know, and then this is part of our industry here. It says 
This is a little cut and paste I made from Forbes. It says, the added bonus of the move was the cost. Other than keep the, keep the team fueled, the creative effort cost approximately $4 million less than the price of pairing a TV spot. They're equating these two things, right? Yeah, it cost, four million, it cost $4 million less because that's what it was worth, right? You know, the, 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 um, if you put a cost per thousand on, on that view there, you know, that might have been worth a $2,000 audience, a $10,000 audience, maybe a $100,000 audience. So, yeah, yeah. But, again, to my point about being the curmudgeonly guy, old guy, though, right, is that how much did that help my business? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have done it, but let's have some perspective, right? And just for your idea about the 10 most retweeted tweets of all time, and this is going to be hard to read, so uh, I'll show you what this is. The top one here, the most retweets, 3.6 million. Uh, that's from the guy that did the Wendy's thing. So how many retweets? If I get chicken nuggets for life. And so he had he tried to get more than Ellen, who's the second on the list. Her tweet of 3.4 million retweets. 3.4 million from the, um, the uh, I guess it was the Oscars, when she hosted it, in March 2000. The next one is... Uh, this is a One Direction one. This is when One Direction broke up. And um, let's see, uh, Barack Obama, that was uh, right after Charlottesville. Uh, this says Lemonade. This is uh, somewhere over uh, in Europe. It is a contest associated with that. The Penn State uh, IFC and the Fraternity Council, this is their tweet after um, Houston. And it would say, if you, pull, you retweet, 15 cents will go to um, <coughs> Hurricane Relief. So that is from this year. Ariana Grande, this was after the uh, terrorist attack in London, the concert she was there. Um, this one is in is an Indonesian businessman who's running a, a promotion. So you have a million retweets. Uh, four more years, this is Barack Obama after the election in 2012. And then this was uh, from earlier this year, uh, his last day in office. So he has three of the top ten retweets of all time on there. So I guess the other part of that is, though, is just looking at the scale. <laughs> the most retweeted tweet of all time was retweeted, retweeted 3 million times. And again, the average Twitter account has about 500 followers, 700 followers. I think 707 is the number they're using right now. And so that works up to an audience. But to get to those really huge audiences, you have to be the best of all time. The best of all time. Usually the most, the most uh, posts on Twitter only get about less than, less than a percent, and sometimes less than a half percent, Engagement, meaning a tweet, a retweet, a like, or something along those lines. If you have, um, you know, I tweet things. If I get one or two engagements, then that puts you pretty much at the top of the list in terms of percentage of that. So again, good numbers, free numbers. I'm all for free numbers, right? Well, what's the scale in terms of how it impacts your business? Um, some things about traditional. A lot's been made about this traditional in politics. Um, you know, what are your go-to sources for information? My go-to sources for political information now, uh, the Washington Post, Politico, CNN, Twitter, Slate, I'm all online. I don't know if most of y'all are good political, but, but yeah, that's true. Mostly online from that. Um, this is a survey from the Pew Research Center from last January. They're talking about how do people follow uh, the election? Where did they learn from the election? And what, uh, I'll read this for you here. Local TV news was first. Cable TV news, or 54% of somebody said, I learned something new about the election this week. Network news, <coughs> network news websites, radio, social media was 44%. Print newspapers was 30 Late night comedy was 26 You know, national print newspapers, issue base, and the campaigns of candidates. Candidates are the last source, the, 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 the last source that people find information about the candidates. <coughs> And so, you know, when we talk about how the, the you know the importance of Fox News prediction, CNN, CNN, I mean, it is up there at the list. Um, if you were to aggregate it, um, 24% number one source for something most helpful source: cable TV news, social media was second, local TV, radio, all the way down to the candidates. Only one percent of people said, "I found what the candidates sent me was helpful." That divides, that changes by age, too, as you might expect, um, in terms of political. This is, again, last year. For people who are 18 to 29, social media by far and away was the number one way they found out about the campaign, 35%. 65 plus, cable TV news, cable TV news, cable TV news for all the other demos. Um, news websites are online. Actually, if you look at this, this is about 53% for, for the younger audience. 
With this audience here, television news and traditional network night news, about 60%. So again, if you're trying to reach you know, a full range of folks, obviously you have to use, and this goes back to one thing that I want to say, is that digital fits in because not everyone consumes everything the same way, right? Now in the same survey, something that's a little scary, this said, how many sources of information do you have to learn about politics? <coughs> and for most people, most people say between 5 and 11 sources. So that gives me a little hope that people are looking around and trying to get a good perspective. However, our youngins, 18 to 29, 15% of them said they only had one source of what they learned about politics. 15%. So when we talk about people maybe being in a bubble, uh, 18 to 29s, one source, one out of six, roughly, said they had just one source. So, the point of that little point, that little section there was just, as stewards, you know, we need to put digital in context of what it actually can deliver for us. It's wonderful technology. There's lots of accountability that can happen, all those different kinds of things. But the bigger your brand, the bigger you need, the people you need to reach, and the audiences you need to reach, and sometimes, I mean, the best case scenario for some, for some of the digital products is that it's not big enough for a lot of brands. It's a nice thing to have, but sometimes it's not big enough. So where the values of digital comes up is like, um, you know, just like we have in traditional media, we have all these different choices we have. We have all these different choices in social. And so what does our toolbox look like? And when is the right place to use digital? Digital does have a lot of superpowers. Way I think of it. And we, this way I think like think about it. What are the superpowers of digital? And just like uh, the Marvel Universe, I think that's the Marvel Universe. It's not a thing. It's not just a thing. You know, all of those all those superheroes, they don't have dozens of power. They got one, right? They got one thing. Hulk. You know, <laughs> has this one thing that he can do, right? The flash, the flame, whatever they are, right? They got the one thing. Digital's got two or three superpowers that we can use if we're taking advantage of it, and it goes back to this idea of what do we know? I mean, we've been in this business for a long time, and there are things we know, we believe about the business. And then how do we take those things we believe and figure out what the right tool to use? Like, for instance, one of the things I believe is advertising PR works best when it's relevant to a consumer's life. I think it works best now. And the one of the superpowers that digital has is what I call the power of plural. It allows us to think it's beyond target audience and target audiences. Digital gives you that ability to segment. It says segment messages, segment promotions. Um, you can do a lot of things against multiple audiences in a way that you, when you had to buy television or when you have to buy television or newspaper or things like that, you're going to think, who is my audience? And I'm going to have creative and things tailored to them because that's the only thing that's practical. Digital is more practical to think differently. So, for instance, example, we did a project in one of our classes about Progresso Soup. And we talked about what kind of target audiences were. And really, there's three target audiences for Progresso. People who eat soup more often than most people. And it's health-conscious women. Soup is calorie-conscious, portion control thing. Men 18 to 24. Soup's fast, convenient, cheap. And older adults. Okay. In an older world, when we didn't have digital in our toolbox, we would have had to pick and choose. What are we going to do? In digital today, we can go after all three of those. And not only go after all three of them, go after with messages that are appropriate for them. Another thing to think of as being a truth. Works best when delivered close to the purchase decision. Well, advertising. Advertising can't make you do things you don't want to do, but it can push you in a direction to things that you do want to do. Superpower of digital is you have the power to be close. We've always had the ability in traditional media to schedule close to a purchase decision. We can advertise Christmas trees near Christmas. You know, honey baked hams. You probably all got a mail from honey baked hams in the mail yesterday, didn't you? Because I did. A five dollar coupon. Getting close to Thanksgiving, right? Digital can do the same thing. Digital can do the same thing. Um, we can do portable digital devices that takes geography down to another level where you can get targeted when you're next to the store or actually in the store. Okay, that's a power to be close to the purchase decision. Um, shopping clothes, cookies and retargeting allows when you shop online, you get retargeted. Hey, you didn't buy this. You left this in your cart, right? And then trigger event. So things that, you know, digital, because of the use of data, can get you a message in front of you based on some pattern of behavior that you have. I mean, you heard the story about Target, right? The guy, this was not digital, but it was the power of data. 
the father got upset. He got this mailer for um, all these prenatal things. And uh, he sent a letter to Target. He said, I'm upset. You sent all this to me for my family. He says, I have a, a wife who's not going to have any more kids. I've got a 17-year-old daughter. She's not having any kids. Why did you send me all this stuff? He said, we're sorry. We didn't mean to. All this advertising about diapers and formula and stuff like that. So we're sorry. About three weeks later, he calls back. He said, I'm sorry. My daughter's pregnant. She wasn't even married. She was pregnant. And so if their pattern of behavior had tipped off the fact that someone in the household was pregnant. Right? So data allows you to do that, and digital allows you to do that. You know, and then buy button. These are things that come down and buy now. Buy now. This is the holy grail for digital. Another thing. Consumers trust the recommendations of friends, family, and strangers over company messages. I think that's true, right? Superpower of digital is the power to amplify those messages. Provides a platform, social media provides a platform for satisfied customers for more broadly share. I mean, for instance, if you were a fan of a business before, you just simply could tell. I tell you about it, or someone asks you about it, now we can post. Have y'all posted a, a, a review on Yelp or an Amazon review or something like that? Digital has the power to amplify that, and if you are a good steward of your brand, you can manage those. There's a lot of places where if you put in a review about a hotel on uh, TripAdvisor, especially if it's a negative one, they're on top of it. You tweet, you're at the airport, you got bumped off a flight. Hey, Southwest, I got bumped from my flight. Southwest gets right on it, right? So it amplifies both ways. You know, I think about where I pick restaurants. These are where I go to. If I'm going to a town, I can look at Yelp. I look word of mouth, obviously. The Thrill List, if I'm in the South, it's Gardening Guns, a place like that, from the top ten list. It's a chance for people to amplify their voices there. You know, our natural impulse of humans to be connected to people. That's kind of how we are in digital Allows us to do that. It's a lot of power to connect. You know, you can you can become a fan on the Facebook pages of some business or some celebrity, right? <laughs> you have that power to connect. That's one of the digital superpowers. Other media don't doesn't give you that, right? Uh, here are the top brands on Facebook and Twitter. You can see what the opportunity is. There's 63 million people who follow who follow McDonald's on Facebook, uh, Disney, Red Bull, Oreo, KFC. Did y'all see the story about KFC the other day? About the they had a, they they followed eleven people on Twitter and it was that way for a long time. It was the five Spice Girls and six guys named Curb. And someone figured out, oh, they follow eleven herbs and spices. That's like their form, their secret formula, right? And so actually, they, the other day they did a they did a portrait of the guy who discovered that. But you know, celebrities. They just didn't get to that point. Right? <laughs> um, celebrities, you know, people follow celebrities. I mean, it's what we want to do. It enables us to do a behavior that we as humans love to do. We love to be connected to celebrities. We love to be connected to people we love. That's one of the things that allows us to do. So thinking about the superpowers, the power to be plural, the power to be close, the power to amplify, and the power to connect. Those are the superpowers. And those are, those are real superpowers that digital has. Our job is to make sure we use the right superpower against the right villain, right? The right situation. Now, just like superpowers, superheroes have downsides. You know, uh, digital has its own kryptonite, right? A true Consumers want to avoid advertising and PR where possible. Hopefully, you got your arms around that during this business, right? They want to avoid it, right? Almost 30% of consumers use some sort of ad blocking technology. So, I mean, if you think about all the people, take all those numbers of people we can reach and drop 30 off of it right off the top because they use it. Almost all of our students use it. Almost, almost all of them use ad block. Advertising and PR does not influence people who do not see it. Seems like a pretty thing, right? Only 46% of digital ads meet the industry standard for viewability. Now, if you worked in traditional media, you know, you give them tear sheets, you do affidavits, you do all these different kind of things to prove that you delivered what you said you were going to do. Here's what digit. Here's the standard that digital is currently being held to. The viewability standard is that 50% of the pixels of an ad are viewable for a minimum of two seconds. For them to say that the ad was viewed, only half of it for two seconds counts as a view. I'll say this, I've worked at a TV station, Angie says, I'm saying I've worked at an agency where if our ad got clipped a second out of 30 seconds, we wanted to make good. Right? 
And so the standard is different. The standard is different. So, and also the other part of this is, is that the people who view it, you know, those Russian bots that whatever they might be doing, they're just doing the political stuff for fun. Their day job is ad fraud. <coughs> Clicking on ads and, and accumulating, you know, revenue from people pretending to see the ads, right? That's what their day job is. Much of the value of digital advertising is driven by the availability of consumer information. So one of the things that the promise of the superpower is that because we know you better, we can target better. 92% of U.S. consumers are worried about privacy. 74% have limited their online activity because of that. And a lot of times it's about, I don't enter all the information. And 47% said they quit using it because it asked for too much information. I ask this question to my students all the time. I said, how much of your life is, how much information about your life do you put on the internet? How much of it is true? And a lot of them, I give them a scale of 1 to 10, and a lot of them put it around 6 or 7. Sometimes they're hiding from grandma, right, or mom, right? But the fact is, is that the promise is that we know these consumers, and those consumers don't feel comfortable sharing that information back with us. And so, therefore, we have to take it with the grain of salt that we know. Now, we've all been experienced enough with digital to know they do a pretty good job. I mean, I get fed things that I think, oh, yeah, I'm interested in that. I don't know how, how that got to be, right? But, but we have to take it with a grain of salt that that information is not being shared accurately. Another thing, clients want to minimize the amount of money that they're paying to their agency. They want as much money as possible to go into after what they consider deliverable. 40% of the money spent on mobile advertising actually goes to the agency for fees and production. So $1,000 that a client is spending on mobile advertising, 40% of that's going to the agency. As opposed to, you hope as an agency, $1,000 you're spending on television, you're hoping you get 5 or 6% of that, depending. <laughs> Certainly not getting 15% anymore. It's just very expensive. It's very time consuming. Because to take advantage of the superpowers of plural, to have multiple campaigns and multiple audiences and multiple messages. And the other thing is, is that in digital, your ads burn out so much quicker. If you run any ads on, on Facebook, you know that response rate quits after 24 hours, you hope. It's taking that long, right? So you have to do something else. You have to produce other versions. So producing all those versions costs money. So ad, ad blockers, viewability, accountability, privacy concerns, agency production costs, all of those are things that are the kryptonite a little bit to digital, things you have to take advantage of uh, to understand. A lot of these haven't been taken, uh, taken into account because there has been such a rush in our business to be, let's, let's keep moving this technology forward, let's get into it, right? And so now people are starting to say, wait a second, I just spent, a, you know, if I'm Procter & Gamble, I just dropped 200, 350 million dollars on digital, and you're telling me that 30% of that might have been bots? I need, to, I need to know better than that, right? And so these things are starting to be figured out. We've moved the industry far ahead, and we're now we're coming back to take care of things that we probably should have taken care of beforehand. So just to summarize a little bit, news are thinking of focus. Don't think versus. Don't think traditional versus digital. Think and. Traditional and digital. Think about it as together. Make sure that your expectations are commensurate with the scale of what you can deliver in digital. It has a number of superpowers, but it doesn't have unlimited superpowers. Okay, it's not that way. And understand that kryptonite exists for digital advertising. I mean, again, in our role as stewards, we need to be aware of those. Now, I've got one other thing, and this is all bound up in our fascination with digital, and it has to do with these people, millennials, right? Part of our Part of our understanding of digital and our desire to do digital is our desire to target these people, okay? And so there's become something magical about millennials. And I love them. I, have own, I own one of my own, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because I continue to make payments on it. <laughs> but we've assigned magical words and meanings to millennials just like we have with digital. And so one of the things I would suggest to you is that in, if, we, if you can't be in the digital space without having a clear-eyed understanding of what that audience is about, too. And so one of the things I would suggest to you in terms of making a translation, just to help us bring us back to earth a little bit, is that every time you use millennial, replace it with young adult. Young adult. Because in conventional wisdom, when we talk about millennials, it becomes a discussion about a lot of other things that aren't central to their lives. 
I mean, when you put young adult there, then all of a sudden there becomes some universal understandings because, you know, love, marriage, families, all those different kinds of things, it reminds you of that. You might, you know, you might say today's young adult, if you want to make something like that. But if you go through that exercise, it demystifies that a little bit, and it helps you not to get bought up in the hype just like we did. Before. And so that's what I got. Thank, thank you, Chris. I hope I did good for you today. Um, but if you have any questions. Yeah, if you got that. Yeah. 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 I got nice life. But in the spirit of five for five and uh, since we're in the ministry, I'm going to do a shameless plug. You get your choice of either two tickets to Holidays on the River Ice Skating or the Husky Story Warrior. Ooh, fair show. Hopefully, I won't kill myself doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do you want to have anything in the last minute? No.